because there is this ongoing presumption that the discussion is actually easy. And people make it easy for themselves by saying, my opponents are all evil, my opponents are all Nazis, my opponents are all fascists or racists or whatever. I think we have to actually go back to Majid's question about one culture being better than another. Because actually, once you tease that apart, some of these other issues become clearer. So there's one way in which it actually is impossible that one culture is better than another. It's like asking, is, are fig trees better than elephants? That question does not compute, yeah. right? You can't answer. No, they answer. are not. Elephants are amazing. Well, that... <laughs> I'm with Josh here. Yeah. <laughs> Figophobic. All right. I could pick a better example than fig trees, apparently. But, um, but nonetheless, the point is, at one level, all cultures are an evolutionary response to some circumstances. And in those circumstances, they are liable to be best. When we compare them under arbitrary circumstances, we've got a very different puzzle. But, so, but you're privileging survival over human well-being. No, I'm saying this is the least important fact about it. So we right. can say uh, Inuit culture is surely best for the Arctic, right? If we, you know, if we took Aboriginal culture to the Arctic, it would last all of, you know, an hour. Um, so the idea is they're all equal. There is a justification for that claim, but that claim is trivial. And then there's a question about differences like the ones Eric points to, which are arbitrary. Which side of the road do you drive on? It doesn't really matter. There's not a better side of the road, but you've got to agree. And then there are places where there is actual betterness. But that betterness comes from an entirely different realm. That yeah. betterness comes from a place where we've actually agreed on values. In other words, we've said, this is something we would like to see more of. And then once we specify what this thing is that we would like to see more of, then we can say, well, this system produces more of it than that system. Mm. So for example... Or less of as well. Sure. Yeah. But if we take, for example, the difference between um, a polygynous system and a monogamous system. Is one better than the other? No, they both evolve under different circumstances. But one is better if what you want to do is reduce violence and the tendency towards warfare. So there is no uh, objective way in which we can claim that warfare is bad and that violence is bad, but of course, everybody in the room would probably agree that they are bad from some other perspective, which is the values that we all share, which then goes to Sam's point. So if we can get to a conversation where whatever group of people it is that is trying to govern itself can agree on the values that it would like um, to see maximized, then we can have the conversation about what the cultural structures are that produce those values. And then we get into an issue with immigration, which is to the extent that you are inviting people in whose values are at odds with the values that the self-governing entity has agreed upon, what do you do about that? Right. Mm. Yeah, do you no. require well, embrace it, of the, the local values, or do you tolerate alternative values existing in some sort of pocket? It's a very real problem that you're going to feel a moral duty to allow in a family that have survived a war in Syria where they were at risk of being enslaved by ISIS, and the high probability is that they, that same family unit, when you let them into a Western society, will hold ideas that could be homophobic, could also be anti-woman, um, could believe in death for blasphemy, and the same family unit that, on the one end, deserve your total sympathy and right. empathy, also have ideas and by the way, that could the, be hostile to others in your I, society. I find this one fascinating because uh, um, a little while ago I was... Um, I mean, I've had, I had, like Maj, I think various other people have, done a lot of travelling in my career and travelled a lot of the world and seen some of the world's trouble spots up close. And it, it has always given me exactly the inverse of the kind of um, tub-thumping view that some people might ascribe to people like me. And it's the inverse because what it's persuaded me of is not the luck, but a sense of the fragility of a culture like the one I'm from. I've just, I'm not persuaded that it's a natural default of our species. I'm not persuaded that it's all that strong. I think, for instance, I mean, we've talked about this before, Eric. I'm not persuaded that the Enlightenment values that I think everyone on this stage shares an admiration for have gone down that deep or that wide, even in our own societies. So I'm not that persuaded that, you know, that the, what I describe as the parochialism of the internationalists is a good response to this set of mm. challenges. Because we're, 
I mean, let me give you another example, by the way, which feeds off the example that Majid just gave. Because we are actually able to have some of that conversation in other scenarios. Last year, I went to report on the war going on in the north of Nigeria. And there's a form of tribal and also religious conflict going on. And I was traveling around these villages, which are Christian villages, which are being attacked by these particular Fulani herdsmen. And they're, 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 they're coming on a regular basis, and they're raping women, and they're macheteing pregnant women. And it's just hell what's going on there. I came back to the UK, I was writing about it a bit, and I was just very struck by the number of friends of mine who I was describing this terrible situation to who would say things to me, things like, well, you know, the Nigerian churches are very homophobic. And I'd be like, what? Uh, well, like, well, I just don't have much sympathy for the Nigerian Christians. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not attractive victims. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, sorry, I, the girl who... who just been shot through the leg, who was four, doesn't strike me as being a useful person to take out your particular quibbles about homophobia in the Anglican communion. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. but, but they can in that situation, or at least they feel kind of mm -hmm. able to, and yet you have another situation, you say, a Syrian family, you, you, we're nowhere near that conversation yeah. in that. And to give some facts to what you're just saying there, so the fragility of our values and the fact that our lack of defense over the course of the last decade or more for those values has actually led to their erosion in many instances. Um, just look at how fragile they are. So if you survey, you know, the last known survey done of British Muslims' attitudes towards homosexuality found 53% mm. said that they would criminalize homosexuality if they were in power. And that's British Muslims born and raised in that country. Mm. That's not gay marriage they're saying they would outlaw. It's being gay that they said they would outlaw. 53%, by the way, is not an insignificant minority that is on yeah. the fringes. That's a majority And do you remember in 2010 when the same thing was done, they asked uh, different communities in the UK what their tolerance was. <laughs> they came up in the UK Muslim community, zero, zero tolerance towards homosexuals. being gay. Zero it like, percent. You, you, found it, it morally acceptable. And it was like, yeah. is this yeah. like, you don't like civil partnerships? No, no, no. no. Being gay. <laughs> yeah, just, and there's, that, one more, yeah. there's one more for you. After the Charlie Hebdo massacres in France, when the um, Charlie Hebdo magazine was attacked by jihadists, uh, a quarter of British Muslims responded to a survey suggesting they had sympathy for the attackers and not the attacked. So this is why values are relevant. Because, of course, mm. you know, I think it's a no-brainer that we on the centre-left make a connection and say, if racism spreads in society, it makes it easier for people to be racist, which makes it easier for people to discriminate against others because of what they look like and their racial groups but we somehow don't make that connection with extremist thoughts. And this is the failure of the left, or I label it the regressive left, that we don't join those dots and say, if a significant enough people in our societies believe that blasphemers should be killed, mm. it makes it easier for blasphemers to be killed. But don't we have to point a mirror at ourselves in order to, f to finish this out? In mm. other words, there are certain things that we can look at, these extremist beliefs, and we can say, and I think with plenty of justification, those are inferior beliefs. They are, they are mm. abhorrent. On the other hand, so, dare I, I guess. Um, Go on. That, that's yeah. what, that's what it sounds like. On. Yeah, <laughs> that's the, hmm. So Twitter, let's, get ready. let's talk to... about the burqa for a second. Oh, please, yeah, yeah I've been okay. waiting to, yeah. Good. So, uh, I would imagine that it would be a widely shared belief in this room, and certainly on the panel, that there's something very troubling about the burqa, and in particular... It's a monstrosity. Uh, I believe there would be a lot of resonance with that belief on the basis, at the very least, that part of your human birthright is to communicate via facial muscles, which are actually really uh, unique. They are uniquely evolved for uniquely human stuff, and to deny a person the ability to use those things is barbaric. On the other hand, there's always, it struck me as um, hypocritical that we don't recognize that the burqa is one terrible solution among a whole pantheon of terrible solutions to a problem that's actually much older than humans. That there's a, a primate problem with groups in which there are multiple males. How do you get pair bonds to stick when you have multiple males jockeying for position? It's almost impossible to do. So we don't see it as a widely distributed property amongst primates. So human cultures have solved this in a whole bunch of different ways. Some of them 
absolutely monstrous and beyond the burqa, of course, you know, female genital mutilation for one. Mm -hmm. um, so we have all of these bad solutions. I believe without exception, the costs of them fall disproportionately on women. But the West, which doesn't have any of these things, uh, the modern West, also does not have its shit together with respect to human sexuality. So we do things like sexualize young girls, we allow corporations to get into our minds and make people feel insecure about their bodies and their sexuality and all of this stuff, and then we, we monetize the sexuality of young women, and it's really kind of a despicable system in its own right. So you've got two different failure modes, hmm. neither of which are acceptable, but to focus on the one failure mode and not recognize the problem or the solution, the problem to which it is a solution is yeah. not fair. And really, we ought to be having the conversation about how do we once and for all deal with this problem in some way that is fair to people and matches our values and doesn't require us to rationalize. Is it, isn't, is, isn't one answer to that to constantly be aware of the fact that this is just an ongoing tension? Mm -hmm. To recognize that there are tensions like this in well, our species, which I, we're I would ever to going to have that. to dip well, there, there is a difference between a burqa and what you just, with respect, Brett, what you just said, because... Don't text now. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> Marge has just so pulled we his have, phone out. Can everyone see that? I hope you <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> There's a man on a beach. He's got no shirt on. He's in the sea, and he's got his baby girl there. Yeah. yeah can you see that, guys? Can you see yeah. that? Yeah? Can you see that? Right? Yeah. Right? Um, he's on the beach, he's got his baby girl, and he's got a huge smile on his face, which you won't be able to see from over there. And here is an image. This is an image. I don't know if this is a photograph or a photoshopped image, but all of us have probably seen that at some stage in our lives. I certainly have. Mm -hmm. The man has got no shirt on, a bit fat. He's in the sea. He's got his baby girl in his arms. He's got a huge smile on his face. And his wife here is in a full burqa yeah. on the beach, right? Because she cannot take that off. And if she does want to swim, this is what she ends up looking like. Um, she has to go in with her full burqa on her body, mm. and she can drown like that, by yeah. the way. It's very dangerous. She can drown. Now, the difference between what you just said, advertising, um, uh, the use of the female body and the male body, by the way. It's not just women mm. uh, who are sold in these adverts. There's a lot of pressure on men to look good as well. Don't I Have know it? So, but the point I was going to make, <laughs> very quickly, is the following. You rise to the situation admirably. <laughs> the difference... <laughs> is. <laughs> the difference is dogma, right? So what I find particularly morally objectionable to this burqa is the dogma that there in that heat on the beach, yes. that woman cannot remove her clothing even if she goes into the water. You don't hear me defending the burqa. No, I know, I know. I'm not saying you yeah. are. I'm not straw manning you. I, I really genuinely am not. Um, what I'm saying is that's the, that there is, a, there is a serious intellectual and moral distinction between the way advertising companies use men and women to sell a product, which isn't a dogma, it's a market-driven thing, and if the market changes, that will change, and a religious dogma that regardless of changes to the market, changes to the weather, changes to the country, geography, or anything, will stick to this one thing, and regardless of the suffering it causes. And that's why I've got a problem in particular. Other people call it brainwashing, but I'm going to say dogma is... I know because I, for once upon a time, I was 16, subscribed to a dogma. It is terribly corrosive and corrupting of the human mind. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I want to just fix yeah. one thing that you've sure. said about my, my position before Eric jumps oh, in here. You're right, okay. Yeah. Okay. It is not the advertising of stuff with female bodies yeah. that's getting to me. Mm -hmm. It is the exploitation of insecurities that the way advertising companies get you to buy stuff you would not otherwise buy is by making you insecure. And sexual insecurity in particular is, um, they are maiming the psychology of large numbers of people by exploiting these insecurities in this particular way. That's one of a dozen different critiques yeah, yeah. we could level and, and, at And I think that's bad, but I don't think it's the same. That's what no, I'm saying. not saying it's yeah, the same, it's but I'm saying we need, we, need to be, yeah. we need to be honest about the fact that we have not solved the problem that the burqa solves, right? We have invited a different... The burqa causes a problem, it solves a second problem, mm -hmm. and we have eliminated the one problem and traded it for a different one. I guess all I'm saying is, because I'm in the middle of this, the trenches of this debate, what, what I don't want to... I don't want people to hear what you're saying you're not doing, but I, I, I fear that it could be heard in your words that there's a moral equivalence well, yeah, yeah, between the two, and there simply isn't. Well, so 
This, but now we're having the same problem that we accuse the other side of. Mm. I mean, Brett is making a, a, a next level point, in mm. my opinion, which some people will definitely misinterpret the first three times they hear it. Mm. But in part, one of the things that I didn't understand about multiculturalism is, is that we were never going to get multicultural. So those of you who have a phone where you can search, um, put in Zeki Muren uh, in Turkey, and you will find that the national treasure uh, singing sensation of Turkey is a guy who is gayer than Liberace, right? And it's very confusing. And then you can look at up fatwas in uh, Iran under the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, allowing for uh, sexual transition uh, surgery, right? So if you actually look at the Islamic world, we are strawmanning the Islamic world in part. I'm not saying it does not have problems with homophobia, it absolutely does. What I am saying is, is that we did not even bother to learn all of the variants of Islam, all of the weird ways in which the, I cannot find a traditional society that does not make a place for non-binary individuals, right? In South Sulawesi, they can, there are maybe five genders and they can become priests, uh, whether you're talking about the Katuis in, in Thailand or the, the uh, Hijras in India. Every single traditional society deals with homosexuality, deals with non-binary individuals, and there are things to exploit. You can ask yourself the question, hey, if you're cool with Zeki Moren in, uh, in Turkey, how do we actually get that to work within the Islamic world that is now resident in the West? And so my, my concern about all of this is I don't know how to elevate the conversation and say however much you were budgeting for this conversation, budget 10 times that. Because if we're not going to be able to live together harmoniously until we take an extraordinarily deep interest. Um, um, on that, just on the religious grounds for why Iran does that, and Pakistan has the same thing. They're called, uh, um, so the homophrodites in Pakistan, there's actually, all, most weddings in the Punjab have, have them perform, sure. and they're quite accepted and normal. Um, is the fatwas acknowledge where there is a biological homophrodite-like situation, um, and therefore, why they say you can choose your, your, uh, your gender and you can even alter your biologically go undergo a sex change operation for the gender of your choice because they, their starting point is God created you mixed so that you, that's, that's a dispensation. What they do not tolerate and do not allow or what no fatwa allows in Iran or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia is homosexuality. It's a different yeah. thing to That's why people were offered that. sex changes in Iran if yeah. they were found to be gay. If, yeah. You could either be yeah. hanged or yeah. you could have So that can change. become very sinister, yeah. you know. What, so homosexuality is very different to the sex change operation fatwa. Let's just go to, we're going to have to go to questions in, in just a moment. Uh, so if you didn't get to ask a question last time, then please push your way to the front of the queue and, uh, and you'll be able to ask it as well. Marjorie, in, in the past, you've been very articulate and useful in distinguishing between the different uh, grounds on which one might be concerned about different spheres of the Muslim community. And I, feel, I fear that it would be remiss of me not to raise the point. I mean, Eric just said that we're sort of strawmanning the Muslim world. I think we're also strawmanning a bit what happens to um, migrant communities once they come to the new world. So one of the concerns is the one that Sam raised about jihadist uh, terrorist threats, so a security concern. But Douglas's point seems to be more about cultural assimil assimilation and whether or not Enlightenment values can withstand the, uh, the influx of people who don't share them. And you've been good about de delineating between the difference between those people who might be anti-Enlightenment values. They're not necessarily jihadists. Yeah. You know, the difference yeah. between conservative Muslims and yeah. so on. And I can just imagine people thinking about this conversation taking place in the 1950s in Australia and people saying, look, there is no way that the Greeks and Italians are going to assimilate with uh, broader Australian society. And then in the 70s, they'd say the same thing about the Vietnamese. And, you know, they'd say the same thing about the Lebanese. And here we, have, we live in a country that is actually very harmonious. And over time, these anti-enlightenment values, I don't know what you would have gotten if you'd asked newly uh, arrived Vietnamese refugees questions yeah. about social conservatism and their tolerance of gay people in the 1980s. Sure. But now their kids are cool with it. So my father's generation who migrated to the United Kingdom would never have heard of Islamism. It was alien to them, um, and yet were conservative Muslims. My father prays five times a day. Um, my grandmother from my mother's side wears a headscarf. And the, I think what I'm worried about, the difference is, of course, they, they then went on to have children, um, many of whom did integrate. The difference is if we, stop, if we stop having a conversation around why certain values matter and why they're important, 
then that won't happen. That's what I'm saying. And I think the danger is that we've, we've basically, in, in a, in a self-flagellating way, stopped asserting the superiority of certain values over others uh, that are self-evident. Um, and it, as long as we can revive that, then what you've said will happen again. There's, no, there's nothing stopping Muslims from in integrating in the West as long as we're having these conversations. And it's when we stop having these conversations that people lose their moral compass. Douglas, wrap this uh, up for us. I really just wanted to f f make a final point, but it also picks up on what Brett, the very difficult point which Brett got us into. It's an important one, but it does allow me to come back to the, the thing we started on, which is the migration question. But I think there's a window through this question which helps us address others as well. I, I've been very struck uh, in recent years by the way in which, as I say, in that debate, as with almost every other one of the tripwire debates of our time, it's set up so ruddy badly, and it's set up so badly because there is this ongoing presumption that the discussion is actually easy. And people make it easy for themselves by saying, my opponents are all evil, my opponents are all Nazis, my opponents are all fascists or racists or whatever. And when I was going around all the migrant camps and traveling all over to research my last book, I came to a, what I thought of as a, quite an important realization, which was that the whole thing was set up so badly because actually what was happening was there were competing virtues. And this goes back to the Brett point as well. And I, I, Aristotle addresses this, and I found it very useful in the migration debate, and I think it applies to others. Aristotle says that there are occasions when what is happening is two virtues are in competition. And it may mean that you're misunderstanding one of them or misapplying one of them. And the one I realized in the migration discussion was there was a battle going on, not between good and evil, or between good guys and bad guys, or tolerant people and xenophobes. There was a serious tension between the call for human justice and the call for human mercy, and that these two things on this question are in fundamental opposition. The desire to be merciful to people, and the desire to have justice for the place you are from, including for the people uh, from the place you are from. And this same thing applies in so many of these discussions. And one way through the terrible way we have the discussions these days is to recognize that fact and open ourselves up to the difficulty of accepting that. That, that some of these things go, that not between you and me, but right down the heart of ourselves. We all feel it. We all feel the thing that Sam mentions, the fucking luck we've got insupportable, unjustifiable luck. And we also know the fragility. And this is not one over the other, but both all the time trying to master that within ourselves as well as as a society.